global business. Firm Resolve, world and business leaders reiterate the need for achieving sustainable development goals on the fourth day of the WEF meeting in Davos. Economic Transformation, China's top economic planner prioritizes tech innovation to build a modern industrial system for growth and development this year. Default concerns, UK lenders fear a significant rise in household loan defaults, the largest since 2009, reflecting grow growing financial sector concerns due to economic uncertainty. Welcome to this edition of Global Business. I'm Michelle Vandenberg in Beijing. As the fourth day of the Davos Summit unfolds, global leaders and influencers converge to address pressing issues on the world stage. Today's agenda is marked by crucial discussions on climate change, the latest technologies, and the hard power of AI. Stay tuned for more stories from Davos as we talk to leaders from various sectors engaged in dialogues that will shape policies and strategies in a post-pandemic era. Now for the latest on the ground, let's cross to our Guanxin in Davos. Hi there, Guanxin. How's it going? And take it away. Hi, Michelle. Yes, this is day four of the Davos Forum. Certainly a lot of information to digest. There are discussions centered around like financial stability and the um, direction of monetary policies, inflationary outlook, and mobilizing financial resources to fight climate change. And of course, the role of AI in the future of fintech. And to get more insights into all those discussions, we are very lucky to be joined by Professor Zhang Xiaoyan from Tsinghua University, Associate Dean of the PBC School of Finance. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Professor John, what are some of the discussions about the financial resilience? How to fortify uh, the resilience uh, despite all those global uncertainties weighing on the economic outlook? Okay, thank you, Guanxin. I'm really happy to be here at Davos, and I really am happy to take the interview. Um, talking about resilience, um, this year, one of, you know, the theme is building trust, rebuilding trust, because there are a lot of uh, fragmentations going on. I, I talk to many leaders, political-wise, business-wise, we all fear that, well, we all feel mm -hmm. the cost of fragmentation. Right. So to have a financial resilience, you know, this year, that's becoming very important. This 2024 is a defining year because around the globe, many places, they have elections mm -hmm. and we want to know what's going to happen. And then, you know, the resilience, when people talk about it, first of all, we got to understand each other. You know, that's the purpose of the conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we understand, you know, exactly. Yeah. Talking to each other, you know, what's your concern? What's my concern? And then can we work together and build something together? Mm -hmm. Right now, for in resilience, I think a lot of central bank have been talking together. You know, last year, there was a lot of worry about, oh, are we going into a recession? Yeah. And, you know, that's not, well, I don't think. Event, yeah, yeah, I think, I think the recovery has been, um, well, in some places, slow and Balance, but we're still doing okay. And more importantly, there's a lot of collaboration. People realize that to avoid getting into the depression, we have to work together. So we have a very strong willingness of stopping this fragmentation. Of course, given the political pressures, every country may have different opinions, but we want to collaborate, we want to communicate, we want to form, you know, very consistent standard across the globe. And then the central banks are working together. And and for the private sector, I think a lot of them are taking advantage of technology. Yeah. You know, even though you know people worry about fragmented world, but then with the technology, you get to reach clients from all over the world, mm -hmm. and that is somehow pushing the world together. And another thing is, you know, uh, during this period of uncertainty, I also see a lot of smaller countries and new emerging markets, they are shaping themselves to be providers of services, you know, when their uh, regulations and political constraints that, you know, we cannot get to, but then, you know, banks from Saudi Arabia and UAE or Singapore, they're taking the advantage to become the bridge among those countries. So I think those are all proof of resilience. 
That's right. And uh, talking about the role that technology can play to make some positive changes to the financial sector, we have to talk about artificial intelligence yeah. because it's dominating discussions, both private and public. So what are your thoughts on how AI can improve the uh, financial system? And are you more concerned about uh, the risks and regulatory challenges? Okay, for this, um, you know, before I came, and also at the meeting, I talked to many, you know, innovators, as well as the central banks and the regulators. How do they feel about this? Let's, I think there are two points. Number one is, I think everybody wants to recognize that artificial intelligence is a good thing. You know, we. Yeah, good. Yes, you know, for even you know, yesterday I was at this session of can finance benefits people. We talk about artificial intelligence, for instance, for China. Does that really benefit people? I think so. We have a huge population, right? And our financial system, we're still a developing country. We have many, you know, immature part of the economy, right? And then for all the population to receive customized service. Artificial intelligence is doing a great, great job. So the first point I want to make is artificial intelligence is doing good in general. It's improving productivity. It's helping individual investors, households to manage their wealth better and, and help them with, you know, they even help you with medical needs and the uh, legal uh, services, right? It's good. But the second thing I want to mention is, of course, when it's doing so many good things, you know, you worry about does that generate risk? Yeah. Of course there is risk, okay? This is a new technology, it's innovation, right? Then we worry about, okay, what about the data risk? What about the model risk or algorithm risk? Yes. What about this can potentially lead to some systematic risk, like uh, the failure of banking industry, failure of capital market, all that is possible. However, I think all the regulators I talk to, they are supportive of artificial intelligence. They, they, they're, they're telling me that we want to see the potentials of artificial intelligence. We want to put them in the sandbox. You know, we want to see what kind of risk is generating. We want to know something relatively well before we put a very strict regulation on them. So they're taking a pragmatic uh, view on this matter. I think our Chinese regulators are probably taking a similar view in the pragmatic way. We are supporting the technology. We advance the technology and serve more people. But on the other hand, for rules, we are very cautious. You know, for instance, you know, if we have financial services based on large language model, well, I, I feel like the regulators are very careful because, you know, for financial advices, you have to be 100% precise. Before we know that, we probably cannot yeah. approve. Like medical ones. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and lawsuit ones. We want to be very cautionary. So those two points, there are a lot of uh, potentials from artificial intelligence. It can do good improving productivity. On the other hand, from a regulator's point of view, they also want to be pretty supportive but cautionary. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your insights. Professor Zhang Xiaoyan from Tsinghua University sharing with us. And that's all from today. And uh, back to you, Michelle, in the studio. Thank you very much for that. Guan Xin for us and Professor Zhang Xiaoyan, Associate Dean of the PBC School of Finance at Tsinghua University. The latest data from consulting firm McKinsey showed China contributed over 10% of global payments revenue in 2022. And this is against a backdrop of the global payments industry pocketing an unprecedented $2.2 trillion in revenue. The report highlighted robust dynamics of cross-border payments, with revenues in this category surging 17% in a single year, outpacing the 11% growth of the entire payments industry. B2B transactions currently dominate cross-border revenue gains, and China's Commerce Ministry anticipates that B2B will serve as a primary growth vector for cross-border trade to further shift online. Now, Mir Lu in Singapore brings us more on the Davos Forum from an international and cooperative angle. Hi there, Mir. So, um, the 2024 World Economic Forum in Davos will feature also speakers from Singapore at a number of sessions. So, who are the speakers and what are they talking about? 
Hello, Michelle. The flagship event of the World Economic Forum is an invitation-only annual meeting held at the end of January in Davos, Switzerland, bringing together CEOs, politicians, decision makers around the world. Now, Singapore, being a global financial hub and a linkage between the East and the West, is no stranger to Davos. In fact, during the pandemic, the, the WEF almost moved its meeting from Switzerland to Singapore because of the persistent risk of coronavirus in Europe. This year, as you said, Singapore sent uh, numerous delegates uh, to Davos. Uh, the, the leading delegation is its newly elected president, Taman Shamugaratnam. President Taman is well respected in the Davos circle he, as he is an economist himself and served as Singapore's finance minister and chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore for many years. So he is a familiar face in Davos. On Wednesday, President Taman joined two different panels to speak about climate change and government investing. On Friday, he will speak on his third session titled The Global Economic Outlook. It looks at the trade-offs that governments around the world face as they balance economic growth, development, and energy transition. Other speakers from Singapore government includes Josephine Teo, who is minister in charge of the Cybersecurity Agency and Smart Nation Initiatives. She will be speaking on the topic of artificial intelligence as a driving force for the economy and society, as we hear earlier from your previous uh, guest, artificial intelligence is dominating this year's Davos, one of the key topics. Michelle? Yeah. And China has sent a large delegation to Davos this year. Um, what interactions have Singapore's delegates had with the Chinese team? Right. So like all those important international platforms, it's not only the panel discussions, the fire set chats, it's also the behind the scene, the, the sideline the meetings that are very important. Uh, this year, uh, President Taman met Chinese Premier Li Qiang on the sidelines of the WEF with both leaders discussing the growing opportunities for collaboration between the two countries. Mr. Taman said on social media that there is much potential for Singapore and China to expand and deepen collaboration to help spur Asia's transition to a green economy which needs acceleration. The two countries are also developing further linkages in financial markets to help trade and investments within, China, uh, within Asia to grow. Mr. Taman noted that the two countries had in 2023 upgraded their bilateral relationships to an all-round high-quality future-oriented partnership and also recently concluded the 19th Joint Council for bilateral cooperation. Shortly after the latest JCPC in December, the Monetary Authority of Singapore unveiled new initiatives aimed at bolstering digital finance and capital markets cooperation with China. Among the initiatives is the cross-border ECNY pilot. This pilot program facilitates the use of digital Chinese yuan for tourism expenses in both Singapore and China, thereby improving the convenience of transitions for travelers in both countries. So there's a lot to discuss between the, these two countries. More importantly, that these two bilateral relationships often serves as a pilot for a broader collaboration between China and Southeast Asia. Michelle. Thank you very much for that. Mary Lou for us in Singapore. Meanwhile, representatives at this year's World Economic Forum have expressed their views on the healthy development of China's enterprises as they seek to explore cooperation strategies with global counterparts. Have a listen. After 40 years of reform and opening up, 30 years of market-driven economy, and 20 years after China's accession to the WTO, Chinese enterprises have been exploring development strategies with international counterparts. They have also been learning from each other and trying to reach cooperation in competition. This healthy approach is also boosting China's enterprises on the global arena. Uh, I'm so happy to see a lot of Chinese enterprises uh, coming to World Economic Forum. I think uh, if you are a single tree, you can never grow in the forest. If a group of companies is uh, uh, take our voice in the World Economic Forum to let the world to see what we do here and what we want to talk to the world is a good impact and influence. 
On the sidelines of the forum, my colleague Zheng Junfeng spoke to Sami Atia, president of ABB Robotics and Discrete Automation Business Area, to get his thoughts on investing in China and his outlook on the Chinese market. Chinese Premier yesterday mentioned that China is uh, open for business. China welcomes uh, international companies to continue to invest, as the China would uh, still have a very big consumption market. Its manufacturing supply chain is very complete. And uh, I recently, I recently, I learned that your company uh, continues big investment in China. Right? There's a factory in Shanghai. Yes, yes. We just, um, you know, one half years ago, we were very proud that we opened up uh, uh, a large center in robotics. It's not only manufacturing; it is R and D, uh, it is service, and it's it's really uh, a great place to work with because I also believe that you know employees need to have a good environment to, to work in, and it was a big investment for for us. In, in China, how, how big? and uh, more than uh, than a hundred million. Uh, so we invested in China, and dollars. we are dollars. Million. Uh, yes, dollars. Yeah. And uh, we are um, absolutely um, committed that the Chinese economy is important for us. 2023 has been basically uh, had been basically quite a rough year, and 2024 many expect to be another rough year because you know, many uncertainties. I wouldn't go to details of that, but as a uh, as a very top executive of such a multinational company, uh, what, what are you considering in, in the board of directors meeting? I mean, what, what are you considering? Are you going to invest but with caution? Or are you going to step back a little bit with, uh, you know, like a reserving more cash to embrace volatilities in the future? In general, um, we believe that, you know, investments, especially in um, automation or in our own facility, are long term investments. So. We don't uh, uh, believe that you know you can make this decision on a quarterly basis. We look at markets. We believe in the market, so we invest. China is a market we believe in. Uh, that's why we we're going to continue to invest because you know the moment you decide you want to open up a factory, until you have it, it's two years. So and then you are in a difficult situation. You don't invest. So in two years, when the market is there, you are not ready. So you have to think long term in terms of these investments. Obviously, the other costs you have to manage because if your market is down, you need to adjust your more variable costs. But these large term investments, I think, uh, you know, wise companies should always think long term and make these decisions. You know, for you know how um, trends are developing. And in our case, you know, automation uh, and robotization, there is no way. That you know, a, a countries can can survive without automation. So I mean more resilient than many yes. other industries. I mean, I mean, think of um, you know a labor shortage. Uh, it's all over the world. I mean, it's a thing, and automation robotization will continue to grow. Obviously, we will have ups and downs, but on the long run, we believe in a in a eight to ten percent growth in this market. Eight to ten percent growth Glo annually. Yes, yes. For how many years? Uh, yeah. For the next, uh, for the next three years. Yeah, for the At next three, four years. But but this is this is long term trajectory, and we believe in uh, in that uh, you know uh, growth. I should say you're very lucky and very wise to stay in this uh, very strategic and resilient industry. Yes, you know, yes, everyone yes. needs. Yes. At the ongoing World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, uh, there's a dedicated gathering place called the SDG Tent. This tent serves as an inclusive and collaborative community for organizations to accelerate impactful change and work towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our reporter Xu Yi visited the SDG Tent to explore how China and global enterprises are embracing opportunities in sustainability. And this is the SDG 10 here in Davos, which is an inclusive and collaborative meeting point and also the partner-based community for organizations for the World Economic Forum annual meeting. On Tuesday, a panel discussion for the United Nations Global Compact was held in here. Global policymakers, representatives of health and environment ministries discussed how innovative public-private partnerships are advancing progress on the sustainable development goals. Change and SDG at Tsinghua University was invited to participate as a speaker, showing the close relations between China and global enterprises on sustainability. Uh, like uh, as the only Chinese speaker invited to this uh, private-public partnership uh, uh, collaboration uh, workshop on SDG, mm -hmm. um, I take the opportunity to share with the audience uh, to uh, let the world know our efforts and uh, and our, our achievements. 
So this is one thing. And the second mission is to build partnerships, mm -hmm. like uh, 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 with the uh, uh, private sector. Uh, for example, uh, we, we build a, a new project, a uh, partnership with uh, Royal Philips, uh, to look at uh, healthcare decarbonization issues. Mm -hmm. And Tsinghua University has already created a number of projects, including one with Philips, the Dutch multinational health technology company. A company representative said that they highlight cooperation with Chinese institutions to promote sustainable development, especially in healthcare. Tsinghua University has a great school on climate change. So a huge opportunity for us to innovate together with Tsinghua University and some of the innovations that we make with other Chinese companies on artificial intelligence, on medical equipment to improve care, reduce the cost of care, and reduce the carbon footprint of care. Now China has about 78,000 hospital facilities. So a huge opportunity for us to innovate together with Ch Tsinghua University and some of the innovations that we make with other Chinese companies on artificial intelligence, on medical equipment to improve care, reduce the cost of care, and reduce the carbon footprint of care. Related to the SDG, the WEF released the Forum's Future of Growth initiative on Wednesday, a two-year endeavor aimed at charting a new narrative for economic growth in identifying the best pathways in balanced growth, innovation, inclusion, sustainability and resilience goals. Xu Yi, CGTN, Double Switzerland. You're watching Global Business, still to come. China's top economic planner prioritizes tech innovation to build a modern industrial system for growth and development this year. Davos 2024, the World Economic Forum theme this year is all about rebuilding trust. Join government, business and civil society leaders for a back-to-basics exchange of ideas. Explore the tough questions, from security and cooperation in a fractured world to creating growth and jobs in a new era. Discover how AI is propelling the society and the economy forward, while also addressing its inherent risks. Dive into our long-term strategy for nature, climate, and energy. Be a part of Davos 2024 as we listen to the world and let the world hear China. China's top economic planner says the potential of the domestic market remains huge. Officials from the National Development and Reform Commission made the comments at a news conference in Beijing on Thursday as they stressed the need to promote innovation, high-level opening up and green development. This follows China's GDP achieving 5.2% year-on-year growth for 2023. Gaoang reports. Accelerating self-reliance and strengths in science and technology and expanding domestic demand. The messages from the country's top economic planner, the National Development and Reform Commission, are clear. We will vigorously promote new industrialization, strengthen capacity building for innovation, promote the transformation and upgrading of traditional industries, and develop the digital economy. Official data shows China's GDP hit a record 126 trillion yuan in 2023, over 17 trillion U.S. dollars. There are challenges such as relatively weak effective demand and overcapacity in some sectors. But officials say the general long-term trends driving China's economic recovery remain unchanged. And they are clear that China's continued opening up will bring cooperation opportunities to the rest of the world. <laughs> We will work to promote the high-quality development of the Belt and Road Initiative, promote the stable scale and optimal structure of foreign trade, step up efforts to attract and utilize foreign investment, and improve the quality and level of overseas investment. Officials promise to shore up confidence and optimize the business environment for private enterprises. Strengthening ecological protection, preventing pollution, and expanding renewable energy consumption also top their agenda. 
Officials say increasing global demand for low carbon and green products is driving the rapid growth of Chinese electric vehicles, lithium ion battery, solar cell, and other exports. They say they will continue to optimize policies and boost innovation to promote the high quality development of the new energy vehicle industry. Gao Ang, CGTN, Beijing. Now for more discussions on the NDRC briefing and other aspects of the Chinese economy, we're joined by Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics. Professor Liu, good to see you. Um, so what were the key messages um, conveyed during this NDRC press briefing uh, regarding China's macroeconomic policies? Well. Uh, the first message is confidence because uh, NDRC is the Chinese national planner for microeconomic policy. It gives uh, a confidence to all the stakeholders, be it consumers, uh, market operators, and foreign investors, etc., that uh, the Chinese economy is highly resilient and uh, the recovery process has been very stable and even robust. And uh, their job is really to uh, gave the direction for uh, all market uh, participants to uh, uh, to synchronize the, their action and also to uh, have more confidence by providing the uh, right type of uh, environment that is market-based and uh, also value-driven. And uh, so, therefore, uh, this really is there to uh, chat out also their next job is how to promote for high quality growth uh, by embracing the uh, digitization process and also uh, to pu uh, push forward the Chinese uh, energy transformation for a more uh, sustainable development goal. So uh, they play a very important role and now uh, we do see their positive impact for uh, all their work and also from the press conference. Yeah. And looking forward, what do you think are the main challenges that China's macroeconomic policies um, are facing uh, looking forward? I think one is that uh, they need to balance between uh, the uh, policy flexibility versus stability because uh, all market participants need to have uh, a reasonable, predictable future uh, based on the decisions and uh, versus the macroeconomic environment. And of course, you know, uh, given the uncertainties China is facing both uh, at home and abroad, and the NDRC will have to address their policy from time to time. And the other is uh, synchronization, because uh, China has a huge bureaucracy, I should say, that, uh, uh, and also we have a very, very long line of uh, uh, leadership. So therefore, how to coordinate between different uh, departments, and uh, between different sectors with regard to policy formulation and uh, turn those formulation into a real implementation of how they really communicate with all the market participants so that uh, everyone can really be there teamed up towards the common goal of development. So uh, this is really the challenge they have to face and also they need an optimization process in which their policy can really turn out to be the desired effect yeah. as the previous planners. Definitely. Thank you so much for your insights. Always great to have you on the show. Professor Liu Baocheng of University of International Business and Economics for us. Now to some other headlines we're tracking this hour. China's BYD, the world's largest EV maker, has unveiled three new models in Indonesia as it aims to secure a leading position in Southeast Asia's biggest economy. BYD has been offering electric buses and taxi fleets through local Indonesian partners. In the UK, a central bank survey shows British banks are anticipating the biggest rise in household loan defaults since the global financial crisis in 20, 2009. And the International Monetary Fund has recently approved a $941 million lending boost to Kenya. The East African country is grappling with financial pressures with $2 billion worth of foreign debt due to mature in June. And that will do it for this edition of Global Business. I'm Chavannenberg in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.